Hello, I'm Alice Crawford. I'm the Digital Humanities Research Librarian at the University of St Andrews Library. And I'm very pleased to be speaking to you this afternoon from St Andrews in Scotland. I've decided to call my paper, Libraries, Why Bother? It's important not to be sentimental about libraries. In a recent piece in The Times, Robbie Milne describes libraries as being like pandas. We're all in favour of them and get a warm, fuzzy feeling about them. But saying how much we adore them doesn't protect bamboo munchers or libraries from extinction. He's right. We all have our own happy library stories. We all remember joyful trips with parents to libraries as children. We were all the precocious child readers who devoured everything in the junior section and were admitted early to the adult library by librarians we liked to think we'd impressed. Ali Smith, in her recent collection Public Library and Other Stories, asked her friends what libraries meant to them and intersperses her tales with their responses. York City Children's Library made me the writer I am, said Kate Atkinson. Without public libraries, I would not have known there was a world outside the conservative religious community in which I grew up, wrote Sophie Meyer. The Kerstorfen Public Library was a holy place to me, confided Leslie Bryce. Choosing books each week was like laying out the dreams I could have, said Emma Wilson. All their words could have been ours. These sentiments strike a chord. But some hardline questions have to be asked. When was the last time you actually visited a library? Wasn't the last book you read actually bought from a bookshop or downloaded to your Kindle? As Anne-Marie Naylor of the Common Futures Projects writes, libraries, once very tangible bastions of information access, are increasingly akin to fast disappearing islands faced with digital climate change. We may have been nurtured and shaped by the book-lined public libraries of the past, but now in the internet-dominated 21st century, surrounded by our smartphones and tablets, with the answers to everything blinking at us from our touch screens, and with pretty much anything we might ever want to read e-published to us instantly, do we really need them or the librarians anymore? The question of whether we need libraries anymore elicits separate responses from the public and academic library sectors, and it's important to consider them both. They do not, after all, really exist in isolation from each other. Battling with the same issues, the two sectors offer answers which, though different in their granularity, are interestingly similar in the underlying principles on which they draw for their defence. Public and academic librarians react with cognate energy and robustness to the question, libraries, why bother? A huge industry of endeavour has emerged recently as they strive to analyse the value of their institutions and make credible cases for their survival. Many are indeed seriously bothered about the future of libraries. In the public library sector, the Arts Council of England offers support in its evidence review of the economic contribution of libraries published in 2014. This document recognises from the start that the traditional metrics for measuring the economic cont contribution of an industry are not appropriate in a public library context. Considered simply as economic actors in their own right, libraries do not have the characteristics to perform well when assessed using the standard criteria for UK public policy impact appraisals. If assessed on the economic value they contribute to their local economies, libraries can boost the footfall, buzz, image and profile of a neighbourhood, but the hard evidence for this is underdeveloped in existing studies. A range of benefit-cost studies of public libraries do indicate that societies value them over and above what they pay for them, but studies of this kind are expensive and complex to undertake and their robustness is frequently compromised by methodological weaknesses. Literature from disciplines other than economics is needed in order to understand in more detail and more holistically how libraries make an economic contribution to society. Studies on the educational and social impact of libraries do, the report confirms, offer some compelling evidence that library usage 
is linked to improved reading levels among children and young people, and that these in turn are important factors in boosting general educational attainment. For adults too, there may be a link between the library usage and higher literacy levels, with ICT facilities provided by libraries assisting them with both learning and job searching activities. There's evidence also that readers who frequently use library computers to gain information essential to everyday life, including education, work and social networks, find their sense of digital inclusion is increased. Other research suggests that UK public libraries are increasingly playing a role in health and well-being, with bibliotherapy activities now widely available there, as well as computer-based cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, provision. Work undertaken by the Reading Agency indicates that reading connects people socially, builds skills and confidence, boosts relaxation and helps people to understand and manage common mental health conditions such as depression. Well, a 2015 Arts Council England study suggests that being a regular library user is associated with a 1.4% increase in the likelihood of reporting good general health, and that library engagement is associated with a broad range of positive well-being outcomes. Yet further research confirmed that a majority of library users and non-users consider libraries important for their communities and suggests that libraries play an important role in contributing to communities' social capital. People place high trust in libraries as institutions and it's possible that libraries contribute to enhanced community cohesion and consequently to the development of healthier, safer communities. This is a report which is surprisingly sensitive throughout to the difficulties of the analysis it's trying to undertake and it's realistic in its closing suggestion that ultimately libraries are going to defy any attempt to quantify their value using merely crude economic markers. It concludes, what the available evidence shows is that public libraries first and foremost contribute to long-term processes of human capital formation, the maintenance of mental and physical well-being, social inclusivity and the cohesion of communities. This is the real economic contribution that public libraries make to, UK, to the UK. The fact that these processes are long term, that the financial benefits arise downstream from libraries' activities, that libraries make only a contribution to what are multi-dimensional, complex processes of human and social development, suggests that attempting to derive a realistic and accurate overall monetary valuation for this is akin to the search for the Holy Grail. What it does show is that measuring libraries' short-term economic impact provides only a very thin, diminished account of their true value. There are many examples of public libraries diversifying and adapting their services to the needs of their changing, possibly shifting and disappearing customer base. On the cultural front, library-based author talks, book groups, summer reading schemes, book festivals and writers in residence programmes are all evidence of libraries taking seriously their responsibilities as promoters of literature. Library creative writing classes are popular, with several providing facilities for authors to self-publish their work, for example on espresso book machines. Family history studies flourish at many libraries, and some run local history projects and family history fairs. In music, the routine provision of CDs and DVDs is supplemented in some libraries by songwriting classes for teenagers and rhythm and rhyme sessions for preschoolers. Other libraries are used as music venues or as spaces for exhibitions, art, dance or drama. Librarian theatre creates plays to be performed among the bookshelves and the Open Book Theatre Company perform theatrical interpretations of classic novels in library spaces. Libraries have been impressively, impressively proactive too in introducing their users to 21st century technology. Coding clubs for young people, a Raspberry Pi club, a Google, a Google digital garage, a tablet bar, a digital wall and digital innovation suites have all brought users to public libraries in recent years. And the UK's first fabrication lab, Fab Lab, was held in Exeter, Devon in 2014 offering a low-cost digital fabrication workshop 
equipped with laser cutters, 3D scanners, 3D printers and programming tools. Libraries are also exploring their roles as economic enablers. Citizens Advice Bureau services are now accommodated on a number of library premises and benefits information is very commonly available. Library-based job clubs help users acquire the digital skills essential to the modern job-seeking process and provide advice on writing CVs, completing job application forms and interview techniques, as well as information on business startups, training courses and apprenticeships. A plethora of activities confirm too the value and relevance of libraries as social hubs for their communities. Housebound library services which take books to older people in their homes tackle the problems of isolation and foster inclusion. Knit and Natter clubs operate in many libraries, as do reminiscence groups, which play a valuable role in increasing cultural participation and improving well-being. Services for the visually impaired, the homeless for homeless people, for people living with disability and special needs are also frequently provided by libraries, as are outreach services to prisons, to disadvantaged families, to linguistic minorities, and to people, people suffering from domestic abuse. So public libraries and their librarians are clearly busy, energetic, indefatigably imaginative in their efforts to survive. There is a clear imperative to prove use and relevance, to engage with non-traditional areas of activity and to manage change well. Academic libraries too are working hard to analyse their roles and define their, their value. Their librarians see that they have long since lost their traditional role as intermediaries between inquirer and information source and recognise that students and researchers make little, make little distinction now between the services provided by libraries and the technologies of Google, Microsoft and Amazon. They know that users instinctively measure what the library provides against what the behemoth corporate providers deliver. They know that they will have to up their game. As JISC's Ben Showers says, libraries have moved from being the location for search, access and advice to playing a much smaller role within a much larger information landscape. The intimacy between the student and researcher and library has eroded over the last decade as students no longer view the library as the starting point for access to information and content. While this relationship between student and library has become more distant, the expectations students have for accessing information and library services have increased dramatically. The library now finds, it, finds itself needing to understand the behaviours and expectations of its students in a way it has never had to. Librarians are aware that researchers at all levels now mostly retrieve their online information from a kind of learning black market rather than via the approved and mediated library route. Interview data from the University of Oxford OCLC Visitors and Residents project indicates that, faced with an essay, a student is likely first to instant message a friend on Facebook to check that he's on the right track, then to navigate via a Google search to a Wikipedia article on the topic, and to absorb, then use in his essay, the usually excellent Wikipedia information. Because he has been told not to use Wikipedia, he will then cite the Wikipedia article's references in his bibliography, omitting a citation of the Wikipedia article itself. Though the information retrieved may be perfectly sound, the current pedagogy, which deprecates the use of Wikipedia as a source, forces the student to be disingenuous and ultimately compromises both teaching and learning processes. This is research in the 21st century and, put starkly, the academic librarian need have no place in it. The academic library landscape, like that of the public library, is busy with reactions to the problem. If librarians are going to up their game, they need to know exactly what the game is. Hyper-efficient researchers, they analyse the situation from all angles. Traditional, data-driven, quantitative methods continue to elicit useful information about how academic libraries are used but a new breed of librarian ethnographers has also emerged, intent on using qualitative methods based on close observation of practices and interactions 
to interpret and build theories about what libraries, libraries are nowadays for. Libraries need quantitative data to make informed decisions, says David Green in his 2013 interview with Sims Klein. But ethnography provides qualitative data through a process that takes librarians out of their world and puts them in the user's world. It puts a human face on real issues experienced in the real world and creates empathy, motivating us to address the issues instead of just talking about them. The Ariel Project, the portal for ethnographic research in Illinois academic libraries, is one of many examples of practitioners using ethnographic methods such as semi-structured interviews, photo elicitation, participant observation and mapping exercises to produce finely nuanced studies about the ways academic libraries are used. Key issues are addressed such as why students don't ask librarians for help, how students approach the research process, how students use library spaces and how the library's instructional services are marketed to teaching faculty. Other ethnographic studies shine light on a range of library behaviours. Researchers at Cornell University use qualitative methods to observe a day in the life of a researcher and try to envisage what the research library of the future should look like. Nancy Fried Foster, senior anthropologist for libraries and social communication at Ithaca, has worked with an on-site team at the University of Nevada Library using methods of design anthropology collecting artefacts and conducting interviews to explore the kind of spaces students actually need to do their work. Gina Hunter and Dane Ward organised a student-led ethnographic study at the Milner Library of Illinois State University with the aim of discovering simply what are students doing in the library. Donna Langclo, the anthropologist in the Stacks, blogs regularly about library matters from her position as library ethnographer at UNC Charlotte and she finds that her anthropological eye is valuable in pinpointing not just ways that academic institutions and libraries can reshape themselves for that future of libraries we keep hearing and talking about, but also in illuminating the current nature of scholarly work and the relationship of that work to the world outside of academia. Academic librarians, like public librarians, are busy too with efforts to reinvent themselves to diversify their areas of activity and to integrate themselves convincingly into fast emerging new scholarly communications processes. A glance at the website of my own academic library confirms that we provide open access support, a journal hosting service, an institutional repository with links to the university's current research information system, a research data management team, a digital humanities librarian and a team of IT developers offering support for digital projects throughout the university. Our academic liaison team deliver an impressive programme of library instructions to students and staff in all subjects and at all levels, and is much in demand for its range of teaching skills. Our special collections librarians too have substantial teaching commitments, assisting academic staff in the School of History with classes in paleography and book history. As both quantitative and qualitative study, studies show, we are in an era in which academic librarians are constantly having to recalibrate and regroup, reshaping their services to meet different demands and redirecting traditional skills to new purposes. Librarians' bibliographic skills, formerly focused on the creation of catalogue records for books, are now used to ensure that inputs to the institutional CRIS are accurate and consistent an important contribution to the processes of the UK's research excellence framework. As academic research becomes increasingly digital, they can offer their repositories for the safe storage of data and for the publication of the open access outputs mandated by the UK Research Council funders. They can advise on and support digital humanities projects, offering where relevant material digitised from their special collections as well as the harder skills of library-based applications developers. Their collection management skills need increasingly to extend to electronic collections, and they should be able not only to manage the collections they buy, but also to offer platforms which can host their institution's own electronic journals set up, edited and maintained by academic staff. 
They must develop their roles as publishers as well as organisers of material. The impressive imprint of the library-based University of Michigan Press is a useful case in point. Proficient and responsive shapeshifters, academic librarians are now teachers, marketing officers, data analysts, domain experts, web designers, applications developers, administrators, anthropologists, ethnographers, in addition to much else. And their libraries are agile and resilient. So we are all indeed greatly bothered about the future of libraries. Studies, analysis and attempts to justify them abound. But why is it we bother? Why are we so disturbed at the thought that we might in the end Google search our libraries out of existence? That there might before too long be no need for a student ever to visit a university library to get his essay done? That it might soon become impossible to stock up for a wet weekend with a pile of crime thrillers from our local public library? It's almost as though we can see the careful metrics of the studies we impose on our libraries crunching too inexorably towards a conclusion we do not like, and that we lunge towards the stop button before the final calculation can be broadcast. Yes, an analysis of the economic contribution of a public library is likely to conclude that the stark fiscal return from them is negligible. Yes, the nuanced ethnographies of academic library use will probably indicate that students can do most of their work far away from any library building and even without any of the library's resources. But these are conclusions that on the whole we'd rather not accept. We throw ourselves on the path of the library annihilation juggernaut, crying, no, we want our libraries all the same. Why do we do this? Is it perhaps because there's an element of emotion in the equation which our careful studies don't fully recognise. I said at the start that it's important not to be sentimental about libraries and that would indeed be a dangerous route to follow. I wonder, however, if the simple fact that libraries do actually inspire sentiments in us at all might be significant in itself. Sentiment is a poor thing, but emotion, its more respectable cousin, might perhaps be something worth considering. Libraries undoubtedly inspire strong emotional responses. We love beautiful library buildings, feel our spirits lift when we enter them, and are drawn to images of their fine architectures. When James Campbell's The Library, A World History was published in 2013, sumptuously illustrated with photographs by Will Price, its first print run sold out in two months. We gaze at the pictures of Duke Humphrey's library in Oxford, or the Escorial Library in Spain, or the long room of Dublin's Trinity College Library, and imagine ourselves settling to read in a glimpsed corner, or at a desk we, we could for a precious hour or so called just ours. Entering a gorgeous library, we enjoy the otherness of a place apart, a place where the architecture caresses us, makes us feel good, and lets us think. We find ourselves using other or out-of-the-ordinary language too to describe libraries' effects on us. Here is Catherine Russ, director of Troy Public Library in Michigan, telling children why they should come to her library. The library is a place of adventure. The books on the shelves are not books but horses waiting to gallop you across the desert, ships ready to send you on a quest to find buried riches on Treasure Island and spaceships blasting across unknown galaxies, looking for life on other planets. They are fast cars, magic wands and new friends. And here is Jude Kelly, Artistic Director of London's South Bank Centre, offering similar encouragement. Finding a good library is like stumbling across a cave of treasure. It will bring you wealth beyond measure. It will change your life. It's bewildering in the possibilities it unleashes and it's bound up in history as well as the future. Thinking about libraries forces us surprisingly frequently to think beyond the prosaic, to draw on the figurative, to use metaphors and similes in ways which nudge us more closely towards poetry than most of us will ever risk going. Yes, these responses may be verbally over the top, may attract the red pen of the tutor or book editor, 
but we recognise from their contexts, commissioned open letters to potential young users of libraries, that they are not sentimental. The words used are carefully considered, profoundly intentional. We understand the emotions which have inspired the tropes and we respect them. We identify libraries with the aspirational. Why else would we be so delighted by the many hero librarians of popular literature and film advancing into bookish labyrinths to solve mysteries with their arcane information science skills? We accept gleefully the ridiculous premise of US TV film series The Librarians that, Phil, that Flynn Carson, Noah Weil, rather than being a safe, stereotypical staff member of the Metropolitan Public Library, is instead the protector of ancient magical items in the library's secret strong rooms, his task to launch himself and his colleagues on a series of quests to recover the Spear of Destiny, the Philosopher's Stone, the Judas Chalice, a crystal skull and other mythical challenge objects. Other hero librarians reach for other holy grails. Evie Carnahan in the Mummy films, travelling round the world to seek the lost book of Amun-Ra. Lerial in Garth Nix's Abhorsen novels on her quest to bind the evil Oranis and save the land. Batgirl Barbara Gordon using her library know-how to pursue the bad guys. Rupert Giles, school librarian in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Lucian, the trusted librarian of the Library of Dreams in Neil Gaiman's The Sandman comic book series. We are beguiled by the trope of the librarian as quester, adventurer, solver of mysteries, the one with all the answers. Libraries make us think big. We like the idea of the library as the repository of all human knowledge, and are as impressed by the vast universal collecting endeavour of the ancient library of Alexandria as by Terry Pratchett's Discworld concept of all libraries everywhere being connected in an infinitely extending L space, library space, the place where our reading of books takes us. There is a trace of the train spotter in all of us. We are exhilarated by the possibility of collecting everything ever written and locking it securely in the print or digital library vault. The idea too that libraries can be for everyone is seductive. In creating a UK public library system which can deliver any book free to anyone who requests it, we have done quite a remarkable thing. In the library, all leaders, readers are equal, every book available to everyone. A headline in the Scotsman newspaper caught my eye a few weeks ago. Prayer book feared destroyed is secured for Scotland after vanishing for 300 years, wrote Brian Ferguson, the paper's arts correspondent. The article told the story of an early 14th century breviary, its origins traceable to historic Sweetheart Abbey in Dumfries, which had been missing from its known source for centuries but miraculously discovered and recognised by experts at an auction house in Vienna and acquired after a strenuous fundraising drive by the National Library of Scotland. What struck me as I read was the triumphant tone of the story being told, the sense not only that the book was being brought home to its own country, but that, but that it was destined for safety and a cherished life in a library which had longed for it. It was, in its way, an emotional piece. The nation had wanted the book back. The National Library would nurse it with care. It had been secured in the archives. We do want our libraries to keep our precious things safe and value their long-established role as guardians of our culture's heritage. Archives and special collections departments everywhere have an unassailable role to play in providing safe harbours for the rare books and manuscripts which have defined our society in the past and may hold information to guide us in the future. These things need the library's clean shelves, acid-free boxes, correctly regulated temperatures and robust catalogue infrastructures which will ensure that they are not lost. And libraries make us, their users, feel safe also. We all have our favourite places to sit in the library, the desk by the window, the desk by the radiator, the desk cocooned by bookshelves. 
Author Miriam Tews told Ali Smith about the day she sat at work in a Toronto public library and saw her own mother come in, settle herself in a sunlit window seat and fall asleep. She watched as the library assistant approached her and gave her a tentative shake. Her mother didn't wake up. The assistant stepped back, stood as if thinking about it for a moment, then left her mother sleeping in the library sunlight. Vulnerable, exposed, fragile in her surrender to sleep, the mother is gathered into the profound safety of the library. Sometimes the simplest statements about the emotions libraries arouse in us are the best, and nowadays the blogosphere is a good place to find emotions being expressed. Here is blogger Julia Seals on why libraries are the best places to hang out. Why go to the library, she asks, responding with straightforward forward candour. There are books there, and who wouldn't want to hang out where they keep all the books? It's quiet. Sometimes you just need a bit of a respite from everyday life. Librarians can recommend books when they're not shushing you, if that actually ever happens. Librarians are truly very helpful. You can read for free. The great thing about a library is you can read and check out as many books as you want for no cost. You'll feel productive. Something about a library just inspires feelings of productivity, whether it's your university's beautiful study spot or your town's local branch. For times when you need to crack down and get some things checked off your to-do list, the library is the place to go. You're surrounded by other people who love books. What better place to meet an attractive stranger than surrounded by shelves of books? They're full of history. Some libraries have been around a pretty long time, which you'll discover as you flip through some of the books. Doesn't it make you wonder exactly who checked out that book before you? Everything is a story, people. In the end, perhaps we must bother with libraries because they are an emotional, even a psychological necessity. We're attracted to their book-lined spaces, to the respite they offer from the prose of ordinary life, to the safety they promise both for ourselves and for the things we value in our culture. Libraries let us reach for poetry and think large thoughts. They let our souls sleep for a while in the sun. But bottom line, and unsentimentally, let's recognise that in creating libraries we've created something we like, something we want to fight for when we think we might be about to lose it. That's worth bothering about.